Okay. All righty. So let's go ahead and start with chapter four. Uh, now, chapter four is on prenatal care. And also, what happens to the woman as she adapts to pregnancy? As we all know, pregnancy is, is, um, is a time of a lot of things happening psychologically and physiologically. So what I want to start out with is um let me get my powerpoint and i love seeing everybody but i want to show i want to have this to keep myself on track so i'm going to share my screen and um, so you got your notes that i gave you let's see chapter four and use your use your notes as we go through this to really help you to understand everything okay here we go. Mm -hmm. Now, go ahead and keep yourselves on mute. And if you have to leave, I understand. This is not like regular class. So this is a, a review um, for you. Okay? All right. So what I want to start out with is like how we talk about OB. Uh, we talk in phases of, of pregnancy. All right. And we have these. And you probably, maybe you already started reading. Um, antipartum. And so this is a time before birth. And we also name it as prenatal time. Then we have intrapartum, which is during birth. And that's my specialty is labor and delivery. And then postpartum is after birth. So I've kind of worked... All my career, I have a long career, and I've worked in antipartum, intrapartum, and postpartum. So I had a little bit of everything, and it's um, been a very rewarding time. So these are just the different practitioners that you might hear about and see. Maybe you go to your clinics. Um, obstetrician, um, who it takes mm. care of the mom during the pregnancy. And then we have family practice physicians, the certified nurse midwives, that's my group, and then nurse practitioners. Now, the only one that I know that's missing from this group is called a perinatologist. And they are obstetrician has gone beyond their schooling and have now, they take care of the, what we call the ultra high risk patients. Those are the real sick patients and we do have them. Okay, so this is an important slide because this is your goals of prenatal care. Why, why we have prenatal care? The main thing is that we want to ensure safe birth. Now, by promoting good health habits for mom and reducing her risk factors such as smoking or drinking or dr taking illegal drugs, we want to re reduce those risk factors. We want to promote good health habits. So this is the time that a woman, if she if she's not practicing good health habits, that we go ahead and change her her life, her, her world, um, or we help to do so, um, so that maybe she'll carry this on after pregnancy, which will give her you know longevity in the long run. Um, a lot of ladies don't know how to take care of themselves, so we always educate in self-care, provide physical care, of course, for the mom, and then provide, prepare the parents' responsibilities of parenthood. That's why yeah. we get prenatal care. And I tell you, the uh, best time is before they even get pregnant. All righty. So uh, let's see here. This is, whoops. So prenatal visits. So ideally, pre, go ahead and mute yourselves. Ideally, prenatal care should begin yes. prior to the pregnancy. Like I said, preconception. That's the ultimate. Do people do that? No. Um, so we want to do get them in as soon as possible. Because we, if we want to get them started no, on what? Necessary vitamins and folic acid. Write down necessary vitamins and folic acid. 
Those are very, very important to get started as soon as possible. Because the folic acid, there's been a lot of re really great research that shows that taking in folic acid prevents or decreases the chances of a woman having a baby with an open neural tube defect, such as spina bifida and hydrocephalus. So that's why it's so important. And we wanna get them in at the very, very early as we can. Now I talked about risk factors. We want to get them in so we can we can identify those risk factors because what mom remembers, what mom takes in goes right to the baby. Okay. So we want to have good nutrition and we want to make sure that she's immunized, especially against rubella. Okay. And so because the main thing during pregnancy. You cannot give a live virus, write that down. Cannot give a live, L-I-V-E, virus to a pregnant woman. No, no, no. So say the case that she came in and she was non-immune to rubella. Okay, and she's pregnant. All right, you have to make a notation, but you cannot give her the vaccine. You have to wait till she delivers. And then after she delivers, she'll be on postpartum and therefore she'll be able to get the vaccine. And she can breastfeed with that. And so we want to make sure that they get adequate amounts of intake. I see folic acid here. And again, to prevent those neural tube defects such as spina bifida. And when we get to newborn, we're going to see those babies we're going to um with babies with spina bifida we're going to study that and we're going to study hydrocephalus so if you can prevent something right because nurses we are in prevention you know we want we don't want people to get sick if we can prevent something shouldn't we prevent it absolutely okay now prenatal care they come in that first visit is a long visit. So we're gonna do a complete history and physical on the woman. Um, I always thought of this, prenatal care is a primary example of prevention, preventive medicine, right? I just said that. We wanna prevent things from happening. If I can, by giving her folic acid, if I can prevent spina bifida, wow, you're changing people's lives. Um, and then I, you identify the problems that can affect her, the developing fetus. You know, they can have chronic hypertension. They can have diabetes. Um, they can have even depression I want to pick up on. These are all things that can affect mom. And then, of course, it does um, affect the developing fetus. Remember something. You always want to remember something in OB or maternity nursing. Healthy moms equals healthy healthy babies and that's what we want okay so this is like your first um your first visit here and it's called the interview process and of course everything's kept highly confidential and we're going to go over gtpal because that's the obstetrical history that stands for gravity term preterm abortion and living and we'll go on that um, at, toward the middle of the presentation here. And then you have another um, menstrual cycle. You have to get her menstrual history. So I put in here LNMP. That stands for the last normal menstrual um, period. Okay. A lot of ladies have irregular periods. And I have to know when your last normal one. And then I'm going to ask about contraception. Obviously, if she's here for a pregnancy, whatever she was using didn't work. So we need to take a note to that because after she delivers, when she comes back in for her six-week postpartum checkup, we can know what, what didn't work for her. And so we would give her something, something else. And then I need to know her medical and surgical history. I need to know if she has any chronic problems. Let me tell you, during pregnancy things can get escalate, things can get worse. 
So I need to know her medical history. I need to know she has chronic hypertension. I need to know she's got diabetes. These are things that are going to show up. And they can, and they're going to they could if they could escalate if we don't have appropriate interventions. And the surgical history I need to know about. If she's now gravity two pure one, that means she's in her second pregnancy and she has um she has one living child and her first living child was born by a cesarean section, I need to know that. I need to know, you know, does she plan, does she want to have another C-section or does she want to have a VBAC? And VBAC is spelled V-B-A-C. That's vaginal birth after cesarean. And so I need to know that because I need to know the surgical scar on the uterus. And because if a VBAC has a surgical scar that is what we call classic, which is um, up and down, linear, um, you know, straight up and down, um, she cannot deliver vaginal. And we'll get into that more when we study about that. And then you want to know about woman's family, the partner's family, and both woman and partner history. Again, I need to know all that to determine, do I have any risk factors? And of course, um, psychosocial. That plays a lot in maternity, psychosocial, because not everybody is thrilled to be pregnant. There's a lot of ambivalence in the very beginning of pregnancy. Okay. Oh, yeah. Shalisha? Um, they don't do those incisions anymore, right? I tell you, down. we try not to. Now, if we have a true, um, true, 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 true emergency, uh, um, for instance, if I have a lady that comes in and she's got an abruptio placente, um, that that ha the baby has to get out very quickly, and so we might be taking the out by the classical incision only in a true emergency mm -hmm. uh, let's see if i had another oh i had one just uh not long ago um prolapse cord patient came in and my unit was very very busy i was nurse manager so i saw this lady in the hallway and she didn't look right you know nurses we, we always look at ev everybody and she didn't look right so i i, I put her into a triage room real quick and I put the fetal monitor on and I had very low fetal heart rate. I got a glove out real quick. And what did I find was a prolapse cord. Mm. So I called for emergency team right on my unit. And they came running in and I said, I got a prolapse and uh, we need to get her back to the OR. Now that's, that's where time comes in because I don't know how long she's, the cord has been sitting there, you know, and the baby's baby can be a, truly at risk. Baby can die. So on that kind of thing, we go back to the OR, get her back. My fingers stay in, by the way, once you discover a prolapse cord and I'm pushing the head off the cord to give the baby more oxygen. Um, we get back in the OR and my fingers are still there. I'm underneath the sterile drapes and they do what we call a splash and dash. That means we splash the beta dine on her and they cut. The surgeon cuts and they get the baby out. And then we have the NICU team in there to help resuscitate this infant. Now, the, the, the circumstance I'm referring to, we were successful and we did have a baby that was alive. Went to the NICU for a while. Was a sick baby, but baby made it. Okay. So those are, in, those are true emergencies where you don't have much time. And doing a, what we call a flannel steel incision into the uterus takes time, takes a little more time doing that. So that's why on true emergencies, you have to do what you gotta do, okay? All right, so we always wanna save the mom and save the baby. All right, let's, we'll move right on. And so we look at, the size of the pelvis and the adequacy of the pelvis and the condition of the pelvis. And then we have these signs of pregnancy and I'll go into each one of them, but 
know them. Probable, positive, and presumptive. And I will go into each one of them as I talk. So to start out here, you might have a question um, that you might see about the schedule of prenatal visits. And now get this, this is an uncomplicated pregnancy. We'll talk about high risk later, but this is uncomplicated. So, you know, we want to see them at least every four weeks. Yeah, we have to take, when, they, when a person comes in for the visit, they we take their weight and we do blood pressures, and we get a urine sample. Now, the reason is because weight, we want to make sure she's not gaining too much weight um, because maybe she um, starts to, to retain fluid, which is not a good sign. Um, and then blood pressure seems to go up when you and when you got edema going on. And then um, we ch check the urine for a UTI. You know, we check for nitrites. And we check for WBCs, which are white blood cells. And we check for, um, let's see, what, Billy Rubin. And um, so we, and we make sure that she doesn't have a UTI. Because a lot of pregnant ladies get do get UTIs. And then um, from 29 to 36 weeks, we see them every two to three weeks. Okay. And so this is the time of rap rapid growth. And we want to make sure that the blood pressure doesn't go up because past 20 weeks, um, that's where we can see the ugly signs of preeclampsia. And so we really got to keep a good eye on her. And going back to the 28 week, if mom started having blood pressure problems, um, we would adjust that to every three weeks, okay? Um, these are just a guideline, but you know, nothing's always, you know, in stone. And then, um, you know, we have certain laboratory and diagnostic tests that I've, I've done at various times throughout the pregnancy. All right, let me give you a little safety alert here. So what we look at is early and regular prenatal care is important. And what it does, it, it does help reduce the number of low birth weight infants. And we do want to reduce morbidity and mortality for both moms and newborns. Again, healthy mom equals healthy baby. And so my question for you to think about, maybe to ponder, is how can a nurse strive, you're going to be nurses, to reduce the number of low birth weight infants? What do you think? Well, educating, of course. Okay. Now, antepartum nursing care. Remember the three phases, antepartum, intrapartum, and postpartum. So this is your part. This is when before birth. This is during the prenatal time. So you're going to obtain, this is like a summary here, obtain the maternal history, mm -hmm. obstetrical history, which is your your grab and your para, or the GTPAL. Now, when they come in every week or every four weeks or two weeks, we do gravida and para. The GTPAL is a little bit more detailed. So that stands for gravity term, preterm abortion and living. So that we want to know that <coughs> because it, you know, she's a gravity of five and she's um, had maybe four term babies, maybe one preterm baby. I got to know that. Okay. I want to know what baby was preterm and, and, and why do you think I want to know that? Because I want to make sure that if she had a pretermer, say at 30, no, 32 weeks, I want to make sure that, you know, we are on alert to that so that we don't have another pretermer at 32 weeks. So that's why we do the GTPAL um, method for obstetrical history on the first visit. And then we'll, when she comes in, she's grabbing a pair of. All right, and then um, a nurse working in the office, which a lot of LPNs do, um, they assist with the physical examination. You calculate gestational age using the Nagel rule. And then they usually do on that first visit, they do an ultrasound, guys, at 10 weeks. 
And the reason why is that we want to get a crown rump measurement. That means the crown is the top of the baby's head to the rump, his bottom. And we measure that and we can get a really, really good picture of when is she do? Now, there's that's a really great way of knowing, you know, exactly. And we do that ultrasound at 10 weeks, not only to do the crown rump measurement, but also to make sure there's a heartbeat. Now, you say, well, she had a pregnancy test and HCG is positive, so she's pregnant. Well, yeah, but it doesn't guarantee there's a heartbeat. So that 10-week ultrasound is to guarantee that we see a heartbeat, okay? Because if it doesn't have a heartbeat, but meanwhile, she had a positive HCG test, we could have what we call a molar pregnancy or another term called hydiniform mold, which is just a cluster of cells, okay, that they never formed. And that is a very sad time for that poor girl to see you know that she was pregnant and then we discovered this and so we also at that visit we want to make sure we're always getting a good vital signs so that first visit i'm going to get a good baseline got to make sure that blood pressure is not too high and you use the 3015 rule so the average you know, pulse could be about 60 to 90 beats and the average respiration is about 16 to 24. These are just averages. But remember, when you're doing blood pressure, you always want to make sure the 3015. Okay. Now, I would go ahead and make sure that you kind of can recognize the different blood work that's done at the first visit into part of nursing care. Now, we do a lot of blood work and sometimes I've been on where they draw the blood in, in the clinic and all of a sudden I was called to the lab because the patient fainted. Yeah, they do quite a bit of blood testing. You know, we're looking at a complete blood count. We're looking at, you know, if we do HIV, of course, rubella, titer to see if she's immune or non-immune. We got hepatitis B. So your RPR is your cephalus. Your VDRL is your venereal disease research lab index. And then you have RH and blood type. Got to know, very important to know blood type and the RH. Is she negative RH or is she positive RH? Okay. Because if she's negative RH, then she will get rogam during the pregnancy. Um, and then you do, we have a, we do pap smear to make sure there's no dysplasia on the cervix. And then you have vaginal cultures. We do gonorrhea and chlamydia. And then uh, for our patients that are prone to, um, or put a high risk for sickle cell, we'll do a hemoglobin electrophoresis. And then of course, a urinalysis. So, you know, um, it's important to know all this and the hemoglobin hematocrit, yes, um, this is used to evaluate the nutritional status of the patient. You know, she's starting out being anemic. Guess what? She's going to be anemic during the pregnancy. So we want to make sure that we get her on iron or, you know, let's teach her about a diet. Maybe that she needs to have a little bit, you know, tweaking about so she can get some more iron through her food substance. Not everybody eats a really great diet. And you get to know a lot about your patients that way. And so we're also looking, we talked about risk factors already. You know, um, do you smoke, drink, um, non, not illegal drugs? You know, um, we've got to know them. And then vital signs we talked about and weight in your analysis, I talked about already. So um, this is what we do, the blood work, again, H and um, H, &H looking for an, uh, anemia. Um, also, you know, look for anything else I need to find, you know, uh, which is HIV or uh, <clears throat> cephalus. I need to know these things. Um, we'll talk about fundal height as we go through, but fundal height is really, really important for 
to determine if the baby's growing well is called um, for fetal growth. And another thing I can tell, I can measure when I measure that fundal height is for volume, fluid volume. Um, I also um, can determine how the baby's presenting in the pelvis by doing what we call a lever pulse maneuver. Now, the fetal heart rate is between 110 to 160. I'll write that down. I will circle that in my notes, um, just ingrain it. 110 to 160 is normal fetal heart rate. Now, on the 110, I'm going to be honest, from working in labor delivery, I, I, I watch like a hawk because I don't, it's kind of on the low side. And um, I have to, you know, look at it and make sure, and then also look at variability to go with it. Um, 160 is on the high side. So I had a patient that was on the one on the side of the 160s. I would be, you know, measuring her temperature a little more often because maybe she's running a fever. So that's why the baby started to go a little tachycardia. So anything below 110 would be considered bradycardia, slow heartbeat. Anything above 160 would be called tachycardia, okay? Um, make sure nutrition, you know, especially in the third trimester because this is a time of rapid growth. Because in the very beginning, the first trimester, um, which is weeks 1 through 13, she might have that nausea and vomiting episodes, you know? You always see it on the movies, where they can't hold anything down. Well, it's true. It's because of the progesterone and the estrogen. So, um, you know, it, you know, they usually don't have a lot going on because that's happening. And then as they get into their second, they start to feel better. Around week 14, if they just have the nausea, vomiting, and pregnancy, usually about week 14 is when you seem to see, see it go away because the decrease in the um, progesterone. Okay, now um, this is a good slide around calories. So increase in taking calories around 300. Do I see that again? Uh, increased protein. Yeah, this is where you're educating the patient. And you can also use that um, my plate um, is on the gov governor, govern, yeah. The website, my plate, is really good. You can use that like uh, a printout to show the patient exactly what their plates should look like. And then um, you have increase of iron and, of course, folic acid so that you don't want her to go on iron if you can help it, right? I mean, you know, if she can maybe get a little more on her diet, it'd be great. Because iron... Iron can be hard in the stomach, and then also it causes constipation. And a lot of your patients, especially during pregnancy, won't take the iron supplement, even though they feel terrible. Oh, excuse me. Um, it's because um, it, they're already feeling constipated as it is, and um, and then they have your iron supplement, which makes them more constipated. We talked about a folic acid. And then here's your increase in vitamin A, vitamin C, and calcium through the diet. Got to get enough calcium through the diet because the baby will take from mom, baby smart, and will take from mom and mom will be depleted. And I've seen a lot of ladies during the pregnancy that they lose teeth because of decrease in their calcium. And then, of course, everybody should be drinking eight to 10 glasses of fluid per day. And that four to six glasses should be water, hopefully. Okay. All right. You still with me? All right. And then let's go on now. So another thing I'm looking at in that first visit and course during pregnancy is discharge. Uh, bacterial vaginosis is the most common, but we don't want that to happen because it can cause the patient to go into preterm labor. Because what a woman... The way a woman is designed is that the bacteria would go right up into the uterus. Well, that's where the mucus plug, thank goodness, helps to decrease that. But if the mucus plug is weak and bacteria still gets up there. So um, you have to, because this is a milky white discharge, is very uncomfortable and it can cause problems such as 
preterm labor. So we don't want that. And we don't want that trichomonas either. That's another one. So what's your what's your role? You're all going to be nurses. So what is your role? Well, you're going to collect the data from your patient. Okay. That first visit, that's where the LPN working in the office really comes into play because you're the one going to be collecting that data. You're the one that's going to be evaluating those risk factors. And then you're going to report all that to your midwife or your physician in the office. And then you want to, you're going to do a lot of teaching, a lot of teaching in OB, educating in self-care, providing nutrition. And you might say, well, I just did that last time she came in, but she's still, her hemoglobin is still low. So she, eventually she needs probably some more nutrition counseling. What are you eating? Because it's showing up as you're still pretty low in your hemoglobin. And then promoting family adaptation to pregnancy. Like I told you, not everybody's happy being pregnant. Okay. All right. We're going to move on here. I'll see my slide here. Yeah. Now, these are terms that come right, right in your book. And um, these are your gravita. And what does gravita stand for? Anybody? Gravita is the number of pregnancies. I was going to say the pregnancies. Yeah, number of pregnancies, regardless of duration. So if she's on her fifth baby, you know, okay, you're grabbing a five. And let's see what, let me see how many you had term. Let me see how many you had preemies and abortions or living. And so that's term. Okay. Now, para down here, okay, para is what? The number of babies that the woman has who have reached at least 20 weeks. Now, um, 20 weeks is what we consider the age of viability. Now, I know your book has 24 in some places and 20 weeks in some places. But write this down, because you may see this again. Um, the uh, 20 weeks is viability. Okay. Now, the number of gravita increases by one each time a woman is pregnant. So, like... She's a gravity of five. That means she's been pregnant, everybody, five times. Okay. And so the number of para uh, increases when a woman delivers a fetus at least 20 weeks gestation. Okay. The baby is 20 weeks. That means it's viable. And what I mean by viable, I mean it's the ability of that baby to live outside the mom's womb. Okay, baby can survive without being inside mommy's tummy. That's viability. So let me give you a, an example. You know, I, I used to get the phone calls all the time from the ER. Um, we have a patient here is pregnant. Okay, how many weeks pregnant is she? She is 18 weeks pregnant and she's really bleeding. She has to come to labor and delivery. I said, no. I said, unfortunately, we can't do anything for an 18 weeker. It, it's not viable. It's not going to be able to live outside of mom's womb. She's aborting. So she stays in the ER. You know, you, you have to have a cutoff time because we have to have the room to handle viable babies. It's, it's hard. It's hard to do those phone calls and to do that, but you have to. So that's where viability comes into play. Okay. All right. And then um, gestational age is the, is her gestation is her, is the age of the pregnancy. That's what that is. Okay. And you can look up multi-parent means that she's had more than two babies. Um, I, I love when I get my grand multipara, as I call them, and they come in and they're almost ready to deliver. Their, their bodies are very efficient and can deliver very quickly. Okay. So what you have to realize is the average pregnancy is, is usually about 40 weeks, okay? Average pregnancy. So it's 280 days after the first day of the last normal menstrual period. And of course, we always say in OB, everything is plus or minus two weeks. All right. So when you're using Nagel's rule, 
you're going to that and, and, the, and we use that to come up with a due date. Okay. So how you're going to do that is real simple. You okay, so you ask your patient when was her first day of her last normal menstrual period. So she tells you it is January, say 17th. Okay. And so that's her that's her first day. So I'm gonna count back three months. If I count back three months, what would that be from January? December, November, October. So that would be October. Then I'm gonna add seven days. Add seven days to that first day of the last normal menstrual period she told me, which was the 17th. So I'm not going to change the year because no, it's, it's going to be in October. So what's her new, what's her due date? October 24th. Yes, you got it. Okay. That's what you have. That's how you're going to figure out Nagel's, uh, Nagel's rule, her due date using Nagel's rule. Okay. All right. So here's another slide that I, I put on here to help you also to how you subtract the three months and just add seven days. Okay. Now, of course, if she's going to, you know, um, go into the next year, then you have, you know, you, you, you know, you, you, you just um, twig that year to make sure that it goes to the next year. All right. Everybody got that? That's not so bad, is it, huh? All right. So like I said, pregnancy is divided into three 13-week parts. That's how we divide the pregnancy. First trimester, second trimester, and third trimester. So um, it's just important to know like what happens to each person, you know, the woman during each trimester. And your book really does a good job, has a really, really good um drawing and i think i put it on that that review sheet for you what even what page you, you can go to okay just important because you, you know the, every trimester has is um pluses and minuses and they say the first trimester that's the hardest i mean that's where a lot of ambivalence woman is not she's shocked sometimes that she's even pregnant how can this be and you have to do a lot of psycho social um interventions and then the second trimester now she's kind of come to grips with it and um she goes okay and she's feeling better too the first trimester you know you get nausea and vomiting and uh, not feeling good feeling very fatigued it's not a it's not the happiest trimester first 13 weeks and then second trimester is, is has been called the honeymoon stage because um that's when she's really feeling good you know the nausea and vomiting has gone away and um, or has decreased and uh, and she knows how to handle it, which is a good thing. And um, so she's feeling good. That's the honeymoon stage. And then the third trimester is like, okay, when am, when is the baby coming out? Okay. Um, I'm so I'm I'm done. I've had a fun, fun time, but I'm done. So those are your trimesters. And on in your textbook on page 50 is table, um, let's see, well, 4.1 um, tells you what um, things what things are gonna happen during the like routine prenatal test during the different trimesters, which is a good, I would um, put a little notation on that page because you'll, you'll refer to that as we go through the different chapters. That's a good page. Yeah, okay. Let's move on. So like, let's go over those presumptive, probable and positive signs of pregnancy. You just got to really read these over and over again. I put them on that on review sheet for you um, because um, they try to make it easier. So I think of presumptive. I don't know why this thing has got to be in that way. Let's see if I get rid of it. Okay. 
no, but I'm not. Okay. In presumptive word presumptive, you see the U, okay? There's a big O U in that word, correct? When a, Winnie, yeah. Winnie, are you are you got your hand up? Winnie? Win Winifer? Winifer? No? I think Winnie has her hand up. Are you on mute? She probably is on mute. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm here, Winnie, if you have that question. Okay. So when you think of presumptive, think of you. Okay. What you means is what the woman is feeling. So these are signs that say if you were pregnant that you would be feeling. So like I would be, if I was pregnant, which would be a miracle, um, is amenorrhea. Okay. That means I don't have any more periods, but I, I may be, something else may be happening, right? I may, I may, somebody got something in the chat right here. Are you talking about the table? Oh, your mic's not working. I'm sorry, Winnie. Yeah, that um, that table I just referred to is right in your book. And there's a couple of tables. Let me tell you. Um, the table 4.1 is on routine prenatal tests. And it goes, takes it by trimesters, which is a good thing. Because you can see, very simple. You know, I told you about the first trimester, how they had all the blood work done. And then... The second trimester, what we're looking at mostly is the blood, blood glucose, because that's when the placenta hormones are, are activated. And then you got your, uh, they can also do an amio, and then you got your third trimester blood work. So that's a pretty good, I would mark that page to have. Then there's table, uh, then there's box. Box 4.1 has the TPALM system that we just talked about. So that's box 4.1 and the other one was table 4.1. Okay, good question. All right, so then we go back to the presumptive signs that the woman feels. So she, she she's the one feeling nausea and vomiting, which a lot of times if you cause the HCG and the progesterone, it makes her that. But does she have something else? She may not be pregnant. She may have something else. Breast changes could be pregnancy or something else, right? So these are things that happen, what, to the woman? Like fatigue and drowsiness, yes. Urinary frequency, she could have UTI if she was not pregnant. So these are things, again, though, are felt by whom? Patient. Okay. Now, you go into the next one, which would be the... Uh, Probable signs of pregnancy. Now, these are signs. Write down probable. These are signs that are, are brought up by the examiner. So say, I'm, I'm looking at my patient. I'm the examiner. So I'm looking at this patient, and I can see the Chadwick sign. I do a sterile specular exam, and I see on her cervix that in that area, is really like purplish. It has a bluish purplish discoloration. That's because all the blood supply caused by vascular congestion is there. I see those. Those are called probable. So like the Goodell sign, which is a um, softening of the cervix and the vagina. Uh, I can see that. The Hager sign, when I'm when I'm looking at feeling the lower uterine segment, when I do a badge exam, I can feel that. I'm the examiner. So those are probable. Okay. All right. Now, what do you think positive is? There's a heartbeat. And I do an ultrasound and I see a fetus. Now, that's very positive. Don't you think? If you had an ultrasound, there's a little guy like right there. I love his picture right here. That's pretty obvious that you is positive. So 
look at it from that point and I think you'll be fine, okay? You probably see this again. So you wanna make note too that you can hear the heartbeat. Um, as an examiner, I put my hands on her tummy and I can feel the baby. And then of course the ultrasound is the most visual. Okay, all right. Now, I, I, I while back, I was called down to the ER to deliver a baby. And um, I get down there and um, she's um, quite, quite a bit pregnant and um, did a fast check on her. And I did a vag exam and she was, head was right there. She was starting to crown and she kept yelling, I'm not pregnant. I mean, honestly, she's a young lady, she hid the pregnancy from her parents and she says, I'm not pregnant. So, you know, mom was there yelling. She says, oh, you, you are pregnant. So I said, well, let's let's go ahead and we'll bypass all this right now because let's just deliver this baby. And so I said, all I need you to do is push. Use all that energy that you were using and push this baby out. And within one push, the baby was delivered. So that was a pretty positive sign that this lady, young lady was pregnant, okay? So again, positive. It's obvious that, you know, you see, you see the baby. Um, probable is evidenced by the, what, examiner. The examiner is looking and seeing and sees the, these things. And then the presumptive we talked about, um, presumptive was from what the woman herself feels. You know, and a lot of ladies say, oh, I know I'm pregnant. I know I'm pregnant. I haven't had my period. I have nausea, vomiting. Um, my breasts are getting bigger. Oh, I know I'm pregnant. I don't need a test. And I said, well, let's just come, let's confirm it. Because again, those are what? Presumptive. So I just put this slide in here to kind of summarize it for you so that you can look at it fast too. Okay. We're going to go on to some physiological changes in pregnancy because a lot of things happen in pregnancy. Everything changes. A woman's body is never the same until she gets, until she delivers. Okay, now pregnancy, as I said, causes many changes. So we have the endocrine system, and in the endocrine system, the most significant change would be now we got the placenta, and this placenta is a temporary endocrine organ. That means it produces a large amounts of estrogen and progesterone to maintain the pregnancy. What hormone is it? that you need to maintain a pregnancy? Anybody? Progesterone. Progesterone. You got it, Brandy. You good. Okay. That's right. So write that down. Make sure you all know those hormones. And then um, reproductive. Remember, you know, the uterus used to be tucked down, down in the pelvis, right? And it used to be a little organ. And now it's going to grow and it's going to grow up into the abdomen and now is going to be a temporary abdominal organ. It has to house the baby. So like the uterus, you know, when you look, when you go to Publix or store by you, you know, Publix is down here in Florida, but if you go to the grocery store, look at a pear. And a pear, it looks like a uterus. You just turn it upside down and it, it looks like uterus, you know, with the cervix, and then it comes out a little wider, and that's the rest. So that, a pear shape, that's what we call it, a pear-shaped organ. And it comes, it does grow out of the pelvis because it's going to house the baby. It's going to keep the baby, and it's going to let the baby grow. And so it comes up into the abdominal um, area in mom's tummy. Okay, and then a term that uterus reaches what? her xiphoid process. So put your finger on your xiphoid process. And, um, you know, that, that, that puts a lot of problems on her lungs because everything is kind of squished up in, up in there. Because again, the uterus, no, it normally is not there. So normally she's got plenty of room for her lungs, her heart, her liver, her stomach, got plenty of room. But when you're pregnant, everything gets pushed. And some of it, goes to the, her back and gets pushed out to the side. That's why she's got shortness of breath and and um, things like that can happen during pregnancy. All right. And then respiratory 
I'm going to be breathing deeper and increase oxygen about 15%. Again, we just talked about that is because everything's getting squished. All right. On um, the cardiovascular, you have a tremendous cardiac output. Um, the volume increases. It normally increases about 45 to 50%. That's a lot of extra blood volume. Because why? You need all that blood in there to feed the fetus. So there's a lot going on. Mom's increases. Our heart rate increases. That's why she's got a faster pulse rate is because the excess amount of blood that's being generated. Okay. And then you have the GI. The GI talked about it, the uterus displaces the stomach and intestines, like I said, toward the back. And that's why, too, when she gets to be about 40 weeks and the uterus is up by the xiphoid process and everything else is pushed and the stomach's in the back, she's like, I can't eat, I can't eat a big meal anymore. You know, I get those this heartburn. And sure enough, that's why. Okay. And then on the skin, which is integumentary and skeletal, you have what we call stretch marks. They're they're called stridates, by the way, and stretch marks. And what happens is the skin, you know, it's it's it has a normal elasticity to it, but when you have a uterus and it grows very quickly, the skin is being pulled. And so then you get what we call stretch marks. They fade after pregnancy, but they ne never totally disappear. Like during the pregnancy, the big, really good picture on page 53, uh, figure 4.2 of stretch marks. That's because that uterus grew very quickly and the skin wasn't able to keep up with it. Now they have really good creams and mom starts creaming on uh, her skin before um, it even happens, you know? So that's good. <laughs> okay. And then, you know, we, we always worry about safety and mom's balance can be thrown off during pregnancy because of the growing uterus. So we have to make sure that, you know, she knows that, you know, maybe it's time to get rid of the high heels and put on your sneakers so you have better balance. And then she might have difficulty climbing stairs and or getting out of the bathtub. So again, safety. And I go over things like that with my patients because they don't they don't really, you know, you don't think about it, you know? But when you have a big tummy and your balance is off, you, you think about it because you don't want her to fall. Okay. Now, the, in the endocrine system, we talked about already with the different hormones, and it's, it's essential to maintain the pregnancy, which would be your progesterone. And then um, you have your placenta. Okay. And then uh, the primary role of um, the endocrine system is what? To produce estrogen and progesterone. Again, the placenta um, is a temporary endocrine organ. Yeah. The placenta, you, uh, you need them. You know, they, they, they're going to keep that baby alive. And so with the, between the umbilical cord and the placenta, those are two that are very, very necessary. And if mom is not healthy, then, or she's taking drugs or she's smoking, then that placenta will be affected. Okay. And those uh, placentas to moms who smoke are very small. They, they're much smaller. And they're not as juicy looking as your regular um, non-smoker. And um, I've seen some really ugly percentas, especially to moms who smoke. Okay, so this just goes over the different effects of pregnancy, like the reproductive system already did the um, uterus. Um, the cervix, you have changed some color. We talked about that. That's a Chadwick sign um, because of the vascular congestion. It... Um, you can see it when you do an exam. And then you have the mucus plug. And I talked a little bit about this just, just a minute ago when I talked about um, STIs. Um, the mucus plug is there to keep any of those bacteria from going up into the uterus. Because we don't want the amion or the chorion of the uterus to get infected because that would affect the fetus. And mom gets very sick and so does baby. So mucus plug is good. Mucus plug is thick um, and 
normally it, 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 it gets expelled maybe about a week before due date. I mean, she's going to go into labor. Um, some women lose it just as they're going into labor. Um, so it doesn't mean that you're going to go into labor the very next day or the very hour, but she loses it. And that's because now the body is starting to what? Rib up, get ready for um, labor. Okay, and then you have your ovaries. And we know what the ovaries, we produce progesterone to maintain the decidua. Now that's another term for the endometrium or the uterine lining, okay? And so that usually happens, you know, in the very first couple of weeks of gestation until the placenta can take over. All right, because everything develops. I hope you got to see the little video I sent out. And then um, you have your vagina and then you have your breasts. Again, the vagina um, has a higher um, glucose level. And when you have that, you produce a woman is uh, more susceptible to candida albicans, which is yeast. Okay. So that's when you go in and, and you kind of prevent things from happening because a yeast infection can be very uncomfortable for a pregnant. Very uncomfortable. And so you want to go ahead and, you know, make sure that she wears cotton underwear and then she changes, changes it every day. And sometimes she's changed twice a day because you get, you get a lot of secretions and that's all normal. Okay. Um, here it's right out of your, your textbook, but this is measuring um, gestational height or fundal height. And so you can see here where here you are, you um, right under the xiphoid process, that's your term baby. Um, and you can see how everything is displaced. Okay, this is a good picture. And then here's your sympathous pubis. So when we do fundal height, um, we measure, we're using a tape measure, and we start at the bone, the sympathous pubis, and we come straight up and we measure where the fundus, the fundus is the top portion of the uterus, the fundus, F-U-N-D-U-S. And that's the top portion of the uterus, which is a very important landmark. And we use that all the time. And so here we're going to measure to see. Now, the thing is here, you can write this down. If she measuring 20 weeks, which is right at the embolicus here, then if she's measuring 20, say 20 centimeters, she measures 20 centimeters on that tape measure, then she should be 20 weeks. The number of centimeters equals the weeks gestation, okay? So say you measure, she comes in four weeks later and she's now measuring about 24, then she should be around 24 weeks. Everybody got that? So here's a picture of the provider. He's got the tape measure right here at the sympathous pubis, comes straight up. And that's usually the linea negra that happens, hyperpigmentation during pregnancy. And so here he can straight up that linea negra and come up to where the fundus of the uterus is and we're measuring fundal height. So that's another way. now. This is really good. And I think this is one of the questions I put on your um, review sheet is what we can tell from the measurement is, is this baby small for gestational age? That means, you know, maybe she's supposed to be 26 weeks, but she's only measuring 20 weeks. Big difference, see? So do I have a small baby in here? So I would follow up with an ultrasound to actually see what's going on. This baby's not growing like it should. Now, on another scenario, you are, you, your patient comes in and she's supposed to be 32 weeks. See up here at 32? Okay. But instead, when you measure, the tape measure, the fundus is up by 40 weeks my goodness what's going on. So that could mean that baby is a large 
for gestational age. You have a large baby in there. So that's that would also be follow up on ultrasound too to confirm that. So I can really see what's going on with this fetus by not doing anything really invasive. This is a non-invasive procedure. And so I'm thinking, hmm, what's going on? I might have to follow up, right? Because I got to know what's happening that I may have too big of a baby. And two, if you have too big of a baby, um, is she is she prone to diabetes? Because moms that are diabetic, gestational diabetics, um, have can have large babies. So again, this is another means of knowing what's going on inside. Plus, I can put my hands on on her, and I can do what we call the lever pulse maneuver, and I can see is this baby head down? Am I feeling the head of the baby down here? In the lower segment, or do I feel the head up on the upper segment? That means I would have a breach. So when the head is down, that's called a vertex, V-E-R-T-E-X presentation. And that's head down. That's the way I want them. If the head was up here, it's the heart, and you can feel the head. It's 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 rather hard. Um, if the head's up here, I'm in a the baby's in a breach presentation. Okay, good to know, right? All right, so we can determine all these things. And if mom is running a small for gestational age, we would go over diet and go what's happening and, and go over with mom what's going on so that we can help her. All right. Now we went over already about the respiratory. I said it, it you know, you use more oxygen up. Because you know, mom needs to take in oxygen to what? To give to baby. And the and, and ribs start to flare too. They kind of go off to the side to um what they do is they just kind of bend so they can house the uterus can have the um area. So everybody everybody kind of fights for room inside the woman's body. And, you know, you see that. Now, you know, she may complain of stuffiness. Yeah, and and uh, I've seen that as a question. So that's a good question. Uh, nasal stuffiness. Some women are um, have some nosebleeds because don't forget the, the blood vessels in the nose are very thin and it can happen. It can get dry, get uncomfortable. We talked about the heart. And I said that the blood volume increases like a good 45 Fifty percent. Again, you got a lot going on because you have to supply the oxygen. Remember, blood carries oxygen, so you got to have oxygen. You have oxygen for baby. You have to have nutrients for babies, and you and and the waste products. And all this goes on through the exchange within the placenta. Okay, that placenta. All right. And this is a really uh, uh, thing to know. Pulse rate does increase from a ten to fifteen beats. And that's important because when we get into postpartum, I can go into that with you on that. But just know the pulse right now increases because why? Because you have so much more blood volume. Maybe it's pumping harder. Boom, 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 boom. Okay. All right. And so now we're going to move on to the all right, did the cardiovascular. This is another slide so that you have an idea what's happening. Okay. Again, pulse rate increases during pregnancy. You have a lot going on, the circulatory volume. Um, and, you know, you want to make sure that, you know, you keep watch her blood pressure, uh, make sure that, you know, she's able to handle all this. Now, this is an important one because you may see this again, but this is called supine hypotension syndrome. And what happens is that if you put a woman on her back, okay, is never good, never good to put a woman on her back. You know, you compress everything. And I got a good little slide here showing you that right here. See, here is your inferior vena cava. So you have this growing uterus see, with the baby in there. You put her on her back. What's she going to feel like? She's going to get dizzy, lightheaded, not going to feel good at all. 
baby baby's not going to get the oxygen he needs so you're um unfortunately you can have baby heart rate go down so what are you going to do just turn the patient to her side and preferably the left side because you get better tissue perfusion blood perfusion I mean, blood can circulate a lot easier when they're on the left side so that's why we say the left side and so you do not want your patient to get faint or have lightheaded dizziness. And sure, she lays on her back and she can't breathe because remember, respiratory is, um, you know, she, she, they have enough time, enough problems breathing as it is because of the enlarged uterus. She, she's going to get very agitated on it. So you don't want to do that. So don't put a pregnant woman on her back. Okay, and then here on this one, on the cardiovascular, you know, you get hypostatic hypotension, blood pressure go down, palpitation. Now here, this is called pseudo anemia. What that means is like the blood, the blood is being diluted because of the increased blood volume that you get more dilution, more fluid uh, circulating. You, you don't have the richness of the, true blood circulating, you have this dilution, diluted. And that can give a woman a pseudo anemia. It means that she's producing enough, but because of the extra fluid being cir circulating through her system, it is it's thinner. Now, let me put it that way, it's thinner. Okay, all righty. And of course, she's always at risk for our thrombophlebitis. We went over this a lot already by the growing uterus with the with the stomach displacement, um, increased secretions. Yeah, the you know, um, I've had women who has tremendous amount of um secretions coming out of her mouth. So it, it made it, you know, she was spitting a lot during, especially during uh, labor. Appetite and thirst can increase progesterone and estrogen. Remember those two hormones. They relax the muscle tone of the gallbladder. A lot of times you can get um, retained bile salts. And um, that can be uncomfortable for mom, gallbladder. We've had to take people's gallbladder out while they're pregnant. And um, I've had to go down to the main operating room. Surgeon takes out the gallbladder. And I'm, I'm under the drape monitoring baby. We monitor the baby during the um, gallbladder removal. This one here I always like because it does show you what happens in the abdominal contents as the uterus enlarges. I like pictures. I don't know about you, but I do like pictures because it does show. Oh, oh. oh, hold on just a moment here. I'm just show you good pictures. Oh, oh. Um, where the liver is, oh, large intestines, the uterus. Here we go, right here. See that uterus looks like an upside down pear. And the urinary bladder, the bladder lies right underneath that uterus and the your vagina. Now, as the baby grows, you can see how it starts to put pressure. You see how it puts pressure on that bladder? That's why a woman can have more UTIs. And two, it's harder for her to probably keep herself clean. This is where self-care comes in um, because she's having a hard time, you know, uh, wiping after either... Uh, you know, her, her bowel movement or urination and things like that do happen. They, you know, you get bacteria in the wrong place. And then here you have more of a term baby here and you can see the pressure and you can see what is this called here? A little lordiosis going on where she has that curvature in the back and um, that can cause her to have back problems, right? And here you've got... Um, Stability is a safety issue where she's not so stable on her feet is because now she, you know, she's she's waddling. Remember, um, that's another term that you need to know is waddling gait, waddling, W A D D L I N G, and gait, G A I T, and um, that can throw her off right here, causes that waddling gait. And have you ever been pregnant? You know, you walk like a duck. You know, 
That's called it, and that's why they call it waddle. And um, it's uncomfortable. It certainly is, and that's where I tell try tell my patients not to have high heels anymore. <laughs> Please put your sneakers on. So I talked about a urinary system, and I talked about you know um what happens in the more subtle UTI. And again, that, that hormone progesterone's right in there. It causes the u u uterus to lose tone, which leads to what we call urinary stasis, where the urine doesn't get you know out. It stays in the bladder. And so what happens is that it causes more bacteria, microorganisms to start and causes her to have a urinary tract. So it's 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 not easy. It changes. Pregnancy changes everything. This is about um, integumentary. I talked about the stridae, the stretch marks, the spider nevi. Those are those sp spider veins that you can get on your legs. Um, and then you have um, your sweat glands. Oh yeah, a lot of women they they're very much they have some body odor going on and they're very much aware of it. It's not too, it, it's, it's, it's unpleasant. And then we talked about postural changes and, and there's your waddling gait, big, big time. Okay. So we talked about the safety alert about changes in gravity and joint instability. And they have the joint instability that because it's, everything's relaxed and those pelvic muscles they're going to change, so um, you know they're more prone to things that, that because it has to it has to open up. Bones have to become more relaxed. Bone I think has to be able to stretch in order that you can deliver this baby. We talked about nutrition. Um, a lot of women say, "Well, I'm I'm always hungry. I, I have, I'm eating for two. <laughs> and so we have to say, "Well, you not yeah, but you know, not really. Don't have extra." um sweets um that doesn't mean extra sweets that means good nutrition and use that my plate has protein and you got you got your beans um what else you got your meat or chicken so you make sure she's eating good um you can help you know read food labels the labels today are very very good they tell you exactly what's in there how many calories even going to restaurants they tell you exactly how much is in everything and then these are just the rda and rdi which is your recommended di um, dietary intake and then you have your rdas which you have your dietary um, recommendations but just knowing that they're out there i do want you to remember something i do want you to remember weight gain okay so you have a patient who was of normal height and she's um coming in she's normally a normal weight she's in her normal weight she should gain about 25 to 35 pounds okay now the woman who comes in she's a little bit she's overweight she has to do only from 11 to 25 pounds and your obese ladies they have it tough because they can only gain from 11 to 15 pounds so a lot more you know, education here. And these ladies may go to have a um, nutrition consult with a dietitian. Yeah. Okay. And if they have like multifetal, if you have twins, then a woman should gain about four to six pounds, say in the first trimester. Remember the first trimester, you know, it's a pretty tough trimester. And then they gain one and a half pounds per week in the second and third trimesters. Um, so they have to be watched a little bit more because, you know, the first trimester, yeah, you don't gain that much normally and because um, nausea, vomiting, but we have to watch our, our twins. They need a little bit more. Um, this you might see again. You have to increase your caloric intake by 300 per day, 300. If you're breastfeeding, you get to increase it by 500. But during pregnancy, again, during pregnancy, you increase your caloric intake by 300 per day. And that means it should be like a protein, should have food high in iron, you have green leafy, leafy vegetables. Um, you got your calcium intake, so you have your glass of milk or cottage cheese, things that would give you calcium. You want to go over that with your patients. And then um, here, these are special nutrition considerations. PICA, P-I-C-A. 
these are non-food items, guys, non-food items. Um, and you might say, well, what, what, what would that be? Like, for instance, soil, you know, regular soil outside. Um, women um, have a tendency to want to eat soil. Um, you might know either yourself or maybe a friend or um, that has gone through pregnancy and they've had some really weird cravings, um, starch, um, and uh, all kinds of different stuff. That's called pica, P-I-C-A. Okay. So nutrition requirements during lactation or breastfeeding, I just said that, that we would feed 500 calories. So us a lot of times, you know, I had to encourage when I worked on the mother baby unit, I have to encourage my patients to breastfeed. Why we always use, okay, one, I would always use, well, you can have 500 extra calories. <laughs> Don't you want those calories? Like, they do taste good. And so that's like, oh yeah, that's what I, I, I like that. And so then after, during lactation, because it takes a lot, the protein should be about 65 milligrams per day. Calcium and iron, same as during pregnancy. So again, kind of cheese, the milk is always good. Iron, green leafy vegetables are always good. Vitamin supplements, um, always keep my patients on the vitamins. They're lactating um, to give them extra boost. Um, I always tell them limit your intake of caffeine and alcohol while breastfeeding because um, it goes to the breast milk. And um, if you have a lot of caffeine, a lot of chocolate, guess what's going to happen to that baby? I mean, wide awake. Okay. And it can and be very careful with drugs when you're breastfeeding. Now, exercise. Now, I might see this again. Exercise, you just want to want maintain fitness see down here folks the goal of exercise during pregnancy should be only to maintain fitness is not improvement is not for weight loss i always tell my patients uh if you didn't run a marathon before you got pregnant and now is not the time to start training for a marathon no no, no. just maintaining and i noticed my patients that basically have been active during their pregnancy and doing a little, you know, maybe walk, just walking. Great walking is good exercise. Um, that they do better in labor. Their their muscle, their pelvic muscles, are more toned, and so it helps during labor and especially um, when they're pushing. Okay, we're almost finished, I think. So, um, because when you exercise, you have to realize that your temperature goes up, therefore it can affect fetal circulation. Okay, remember. We got to circulate blood to go to baby. So if mom is having an elevated temperature, that's going to affect that baby. If mom gets hypertensive, she reduces blood flow to the fetus. Okay. And so you want to make sure that, you know, she doesn't get overheated and that she um, basically, if she gets out of breath, I always tell them, if you get out of breath, sit down. Sit down, take some good oxygen in, and get it back up, and so that baby feels better. Um, but exercise is good during pregnancy, but only to maintain nothing else. And this is a slide that I like because it does show, you know, what you should tell them, you know, about um, the warm up and end up and cool down. And we and the ACOG, which is um, the American College of Obstetrician and Gynecologists, they're like the go-to people, and um, in maternity care, in obstetrics, and so they always just recommend moderate exercise. Okay, all right, and you combine that with the good balanced diet, one that has protein, calcium, iron, you're in good shape. Um, and make sure that they're what taking in uh, lots of water, and I would avoid such as scuba diving and a lot of places with high altitudes. You don't want to do that. Don't get overheated. Just make sure you just maintain. No, don't overdo it. 
And this is about travel. You might see this again. So when you're traveling, um, you can travel, a pregnant lady can travel up to 36 weeks gestation. Because now from 30, you know, 36, she starts to gain into more term, you know, it's her last part of her pregnancy. And, um, you know, you don't want to be in a different area, um, different city where, you know, you didn't get your prenatal care from. Um, so stay home when you get to be about 36 weeks. Avoid sitting for extended period of time. You have to get up and walk the aisle. You always have to worry about uh, a thrombus. So you don't want that to happen. So get up and walk. Drink lots of water. Yeah, yeah. About four to six glasses of water would be good. Um, I always tell them, bring a copy of the obstetrical records. You know, um, it's much easier today because a lot of things are computerized, but not doesn't mean if, if you have, you're in Florida and you're going to travel now to, I'll just, I'll keep her in the States. I'll say you're going to travel to New York. Okay, um, they might not have the you know the the connection with the computer, so you need to have your surgical record. If you don't have your records, then they have to re. <laughs> excuse me, and you're in the hospital for preterm labor, say, for thirty six weeks would be preterm. Hmm. Then um, they have to redo all your blood work, and so you don't want that to happen. So just keep a copy with you. Okay. And know that too, things things can happen on um, um, traveling. So you want to stay home. Also, if you're traveling on this plane, get a seat that has more leg room. All right. Um, there are certain seats in a plane that do have extended leg room. You may have to pay a little bit more, but it's worth it. Okay. All right. Um, these are some common discomforts in pregnancy. Um, let's see. You have fatigue we talked about. I talked about nasal stuffiness. Nausea. Oh, heartburn. We talked about why you have heartburn because everything is pushed up. Constipation. Um, hemorrhoids. Yes. All this weight um, can, can cause these lovely hemorrhoids. The hemorrhoids can be cause of constipation. So I always tell my patients drink at least four or six glasses of water a day. That keeps everything moving, okay? Flushing out, moving. Um, these can be very uncomfortable. Um, patient has severe constipation, can actually feel like she's in labor. And they have come into labor room thinking they were in true labor and what it was, it was just really constipated. Um, that can happen too if she's anemic and you put her on iron, um, the side effect of iron would be constipation. So uh, that's why they don't take it during pregnancy. And another discomfort we talked about was that vaginal discharge or area. It's just a whitish discharge. And so some, some women have to wear wears a little pad, peri pad, because it can get very uncomfortable. And um, you can get a back to, you can, you can create things from here. From area. you could create um, a yeast infection or you can create... Um, bacterial so it's always good to keep the vagina you know um it would never be dry but it keep it under wraps um backache that's from you know the back the uterus growing more and causes the back, backache because you got lordiosis here leg cranes varicose veins can happen and they can be very 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 uncomfortable for patients cause a lot of pain leg cramps and then, of course, you get the edema of the lower extremities. What are you going to tell them? Put their legs up and they come home from work. Maybe they're at work. Maybe they're sitting at a desk. And so they're in a more deep pen. Their legs are more in a deep pen position. So, therefore, um, they can get more edema. Okay, if you come home from work, take the shoes off and put the legs up. And that, and that usually will help. Because um, with edema, you have to worry about blood pressure going up to all right and then you have your psychosocial changes or the woman has to adapt to pregnancy and um you know you, you know you have to identify and manage all these psychosocial problems why because i want a positive outcome to the pregnancy um nutritional needs are always um, um always on the forefront because what mom takes in 
goes to the fetus and you want the fetus to grow. Um, so pregnancy can be a time of stress and change for both the pregnant woman and her entire family, okay? The entire family gets expected. And then the needs and concern of each pregnant woman would vary according to where she lives. And of course, according to her circumstances and um, her age, everything, everything comes into play. So it's not an easy time for anybody. Um, Reba Rubin, it comes right out of your textbook um, in your reading. She had four maternal tasks that the woman accomplishes during pregnancy. So these are, and she was a pretty neat lady herself, and so a psychologist. So she basically sees, you want to see, this is how a woman looks at it, okay? Sees a safe passage for herself and her fetus. You ever been pregnant? You know, it's, you know, you think, okay, I've been carrying this baby, but you know, this baby's got to come out. So you always want to make sure it's a safe mom's for herself. I want to live through it. And of course, my baby. Um, securing acceptance of herself as a mom and for her inner fetus. Yeah, that's a lot too, that you woman has to adapt. She's got to change her whole entire life because there's a baby that she's going to be responsible for. So she has to accept herself so that she can and love herself so that she can love the baby. Okay. All right. And then learning to give of herself. If you were young and having a, a baby, now is no more about you. Is now you have to worry about what? Caring for the baby. Okay. And the concern for the baby. And then committing herself to the child as she progresses to pregnancy. These are all we call psychosocial um, things uh, that woman thinks about during the pregnancy and has to accept them as she goes through the pregnancy. And that's why in the beginning, the first trimester, you have this feeling of great ambivalence, you know? You know, and you, you go into the doctor's office and the doctor says, yes, you're pregnant. And you go, what? And and especially if you were on something and maybe you forgot to take your birth control pill one night and you ovulated and sure enough, you became pregnant. So it's ambivalence and, it's, and you have to kind of work through it. And that's where nurses help women is when they come in and um, you just sit and talk. Now, fatherhood is another thing you have to worry about or be concerned about is... um. They go through the developmental stages of parenthood. So you first have the announcement, okay? And that's where the pregnancy is confirmed. So you always, when you go home and you're going to tell your partner, yes, I'm pregnant, um, that's called the announcement. And then the acceptance, um, acceptance is, it results in strengthening of a family. Okay, now it's accepted, all right? And that's kind of goes into play with starting to go in, oh, oh, go into what we call adjustment time, oh, oh. and then focus. Oh, oh, no. Focus is active plans for participation in labor growth and process. The adjustment time can be a very um, interesting time for the father of the baby um, because he has to adjust, okay? Just like moms have to adjust, okay? He may um, have to now have to sell his Corvette and he may be looking at having to get a minivan instead of his Corvette. So that's that's called the adjustment time where they all go through that. And this can be a very emotional time. And so um, and, and take note to to that when they come in and their interaction. Um. Yeah, this is just acceptance. And this is just a slide that I put in here to show you, um, you know, the acceptance of the pregnancy um, in the social network. You know, first of all, he's got to go through a time that, you know, I may not be able to go with my friends like I used to. Uh, that's a big adjustment, right? Um, they have to evaluate, well, am I going to be in the labor room with her? Okay, or am I going to go through a parent education classes with her? These are all part of that impact that occurs on the father. 
and pretty significant. And I always ask uh, my patients, you know, you know, are, are well, my nurses, how wide has the role of the father changed over the past decades? Well, most of the time I hear um, they're more active, which I think is great. They're changing diapers, which is great. They're taking more of an active role with the family, but not everybody does. Um, but you know, some some are more, some are less. It's so, all well, according to their culture, also of how much act, how much of a role they play. But I think it's great that you know more fathers are getting more involved. Okay. All right. And then another area that has to be concerning is the adolescent. Okay. Now, adolescent itself is a time of change and a um, multiple adjustments, right? Okay. So the ad pregnant adolescent, she faces multiple hurdles and she has to go through transition. You know, some of them, some young ladies are not even well developed and, and they, and they have to go through pregnancy. I had a young girl I labored. Um, she was 12 years old. And this was in Houston, Texas, where I used to work at the Methodist Hospital. And she labored with her teddy bear. That would happen. She got pregnant. It was um, somebody in her family got her pregnant. And it's a sad case. But this poor girl, her bones itself were not even well developed for them to start to have to stretch to um, deliver this baby. So it's a tough time, adolescents. Um, and it's a tough time when they get pregnant during adolescence, but they need a lot of support. And these um, got, these this age group, um, oh, their nutrition is one that you have to be on them because uh, they don't wanna eat very much. They like, some of them hide their pregnancy as much as they can from their family until they can no longer hide it. Um, so you have to be on them with the adolescents. It's not an easy time at all for the adolescent. So my my question that you can ponder about later is what potential concerns would, mo would most likely be experienced by the pre pregnant adolescent? And this was comes right from the Time Magazine. Um, it was an article, Children Having Children, Teen Pregnancy. I worked a lot with teens um, because I felt that, you know, they're, they're scared enough, you know, they're really scared. And my, my um, patient, uh, I wanted to get her an epidural and um, doctor wouldn't let me get her an epidural. And his reason, I asked him, I said, well, what's your reason for not giving her an epidural? Um, and this is true. And he said, this was not here in Florida. He said, I want her to remember this pain. So the next time that she decides to sleep with another fella, she remembers it. Now, is that correct? No, that's not the time to do that. Okay. All right. So think about adolescents and, and, and the challenges they have with parenthood. Not a good time. Okay. All right. So my first Okay, somebody be, must be at my front door, sorry. What would be my first priority in working with a pregnant adolescent? What would be my first priority? Anybody? Well, I would assess her attitude toward pregnancy. That's where I gotta start. I gotta start at the foundation. I gotta see how she feels. Remember, this is a pregnant adolescent. This is different. They're young. They're, you know, they're, they're just into themselves, right? And now uh, they're pregnant. And they've probably been through already a shock. And, and, and who knows if they're even told their parents. So I got to know where she, where we stand with this pregnancy. That's So that's what I do. All right. The older couple, um, they had their own problems too, but they're more, uh, they seem to be more uh, well educated. They achieved life experiences that 
kind of help them cope with rea realities of parenthood. Parenthood is not easy. In this group, you would think, oh, they have plenty of money and they can cope better, like it says there. But if they're used to going and do it, and now they have to stay home. Now they can't be so social. Um, you know, maybe they're going to lose some friends over this. Um, they have they have different problems, that, you know, of their own, and um, they have to accept. And they have to accept the realities of parenthood. It's a whole different ball game. So usually, and they have, if you have a first time mom who's over age 35, she's considered to be um, advanced maternal age, by the way. 35 years or older, you're old and obese. And though we are having lots of babies at age 40, yes, and 45 and now 50, but they also have risk, high risk factors that they had to be seen more in the office for their prenatal care is because of their age. And these patients, let me tell you, when you have to schedule them for weekly non-stress tests to make sure the baby's okay, and they don't show up for half, for half of their appointments is because they're too busy with their jobs. So we have we have those kind of problems with these moms. And so um, they all have, doesn't matter where you are in life, you know, what age group, you all have, they all have their different health concerns, their different needs, and they all have to be handled accordingly. Now, another group that has to ha has some problems, <coughs> excuse me, is the single mom. Again, it could be an adolescent or it could be a mature woman, but who's on her own. So, like everything else, they have their unique emotional needs. Because now they're on their own. They have um, child care problems after the baby comes. You know, during pregnancy is okay. But after pregnancy, after they come home, they have to go to work. I mean, somebody has to, you know, do the finances. So the, she's on her own. She has she's responsible. So sure enough, you got to find child care. What happens if the baby gets sick and can't go to child care? You can't go to work. You have enough times that you you call in to call in sick to your job when they do they let you go so they have their problems and of course there's a big lifestyle change when you're a single mom because now you're doing both mom and dad not easy not, not nothing's easy and so this just goes over again we always handle air i handle every woman in a non-judgmental manner. That's it. Doesn't matter how old you are, what your circumstances, it's always the nurse. We never judge. We're there to help. We're help. We're there to educate. We we're, we're there to make sure that we pick up if she's if she's getting sick during the pregnancy, if she's getting blood blood pressure problems during the pregnancy. That's our job. Nothing. We don't judge. And the role of the father of the baby, you know. We also don't judge him. We never make assumptions. Never, never, never. All righty. Let me go on here. Let's see here. Um, in the last part of your of your chapter, it goes over prenatal education. And you and I always say use use the nursing process where you assess the history and culture needs of your patient. You know, you look at the diagnosis of knowledge deficit. You know, there's a lot of good um, nursing diagnosis for knowledge deficit. And most, and you have a lot of them during the pregnancy. Um, and even to tell you, even if she's she's a grab at a three, period two, that means she's on a third pregnancy. And she has two living children. She still may have a knowledge deficit. Okay. You know, um, every pregnancy is different. And so... She might need a little. She might need a little bit of reassurance or a little more knowledge. Um, you plan her goals and her priorities. You always want a good outcome. Always want a positive outcome. What can I do to get that positive outcome? And then teach. Do a lot of teaching, and then evaluate. How do I do? How, did my patient have a positive outcome? Did I get my goals achieved? 
does she understand that she needs to eat protein, more protein and less carbohydrates? You know, that's how you want to evaluate if your teaching has been good. All right. And then again, on the effects um, that, you know, like on that pregnancy has on lactation, taking in medication. Um, pregnancy does affect the metabolism of medication. Gotta be careful with that. Drugs, I do, I highlighted this for a reason because drugs can cross the placenta and they can be passed right through the breast milk. Okay, so whatever you take in and you're breastfeeding can cross the placenta. That's why a mom who is HIV positive cannot breastfeed. And then these, I thought this was interesting. These are just categories of drugs. Um, you got your class A that has no risk. If you have a drug book, you're going to have these in your drug book. And so you go from category A, which is no risk to category X, which has an absolute fetal anomaly. So not to be used any time during pregnancy. So this is what you look up. If you not if you don't know the drug, you just look it up and make sure she's not taking it and it could and see what category it, it falls under. I said this before, I'm gonna say it again. Live viruses, vaccines are contraindicated during pregnancy. Thermosol should never be given during pregnancy because of mercury poisoning. Now, on the measles, mumps, rubella. So, say she came into you, and you did her blood titer for rubella, and it shows that she's non-immune. That means that she never had. It. Okay, you cannot give this woman this vaccine during pregnancy. Now, you can give it after she delivers the baby on postpartum. And she can breastfeed. Okay. Now, another lady comes into your office. She's non-immune, but she's not pregnant. N-O-T, not pregnant. You can give her the vaccine. But she has to wait one month after receiving that injection, that vaccine, before she gets pregnant. Okay? That's how it's so it's such a teratogen to the fetus. You do not want to give that at all. And you don't want her getting pregnant right, right away after giving her the vaccine. Okay. All right. And that is all I have, folks. So that was chapter four.